This is Colin Selleck of Binghamton University. This video lecture covers the principles of linear impulse and momentum. It's from Chapter 5.1 of the book Dynamics by R.C. Hibbler. Today's objectives, you will be able to calculate the linear momentum of a particle and linear impulse of a force, and you will be able to apply the principle of linear impulse and momentum. Activities include some applications, the definition of linear momentum and impulse, the principle of linear impulse and momentum, and we'll do some problem solving. Here's a good example of impulse. It's the action of hitting a ball with a bat. The impulse is the average force exerted by the bat multiplied by the time the bat and ball are in contact. And we'll go over this in more detail in this lecture. So given this situation, how can we predict the resultant motion of the ball? The principle of linear impulse and momentum is obtained by integrating the equation of motion with respect to time. So remember Newton's equation of motion, F equal ma. Well, we know that the acceleration is dv dt. So we can write the equation of motion as m dv dt. And we can isolate the variables and integrate from v1, v2, integrate from t1 to t2. So since mass is a constant, the right side just comes out to be m v2 minus v1. This equation represents the principle of linear impulse and momentum. It relates the particle's final velocity v2 and its initial velocity and the forces acting on the body as a function of time. So let's define linear momentum. We denote it by L and it's a vector so I'll put a bar over it and it's equal to the mass times the velocity which is also a vector. This vector has the same direction as v, the velocity, and it has units of kilogram meters per second, or slug foot per second. Now we denote linear impulse by using i, and that's a vector also. That's equal to the integral of f dt. Now sometimes force is a function of time, so you'll have to integrate the force over time. The force is a constant. This just this this comes out to be this comes out to be uh, the force times delta t. This is also a vector. I is a vector and it is in the same direction as F and it has units of Newton seconds or pound seconds. Now if you have a graph like this one you can get the impulse just by calculating the area under the curve, right? The impulse is the integral of ft dt. If f is constant, we can say that the impulse is f times t2 minus t1. And I'll put f sub c to let you know that's constant. Now, as we've done in the past, you can break up the vector equation into scalar equations. So in the x direction, we can write the mass times the initial x velocity plus the sum of the integral from t1 to t2 of the forces in the x direction integrated over dt is equal to the mass times the velocity at point 2. And likewise, you can do the same thing for y and z. I won't write them out here. But just replace the x's with y's and the x's with z's to get those two equations. So these provide a convenient means for applying the principle of linear impulse and momentum once the velocity and force vectors have been resolved into x, y, z components. So let's talk about techniques to solve the problems. First, you establish an x, y, z coordinate system. You draw a free body diagram and establish the direction of the particle's initial and final velocities. You draw the impulse and momentum diagrams for the particle show the linear momentum and force impulse vectors. Resolve the force and velocity or impulse and momentum vectors into the XYZ components and apply the principle of linear impulse and momentum using its scalar form, which we just saw. Forces as function of time, they must be integrated to obtain the impulse. If a force is constant, its impulse is the product of the force's magnitude and the time interval over which it acts. Okay, let's do a problem. Here we have a 0.1 pound golf ball struck by a club and it travels uh, 500 feet and we know that the angle uh, that it left the ground was 30 degrees. Uh, assume the club maintains contact with the ball for 
half a millisecond. Find the average impulsive force exerted on the ball. So our plan is to find V, the velocity, using the kinematics equations from chapter 12, and then we'll apply the principle of impulse momentum to determine the impulse of force. So first, let's establish a coordinate frame. So we have x, x here and y here. So we're going to use the kinematic equations. These are the projectile equations. Uh, remember, in the x direction, x is equal to x naught plus the velocity in the x direction times time. Well, I know the angle that the ball left the ground. So I can say that uh, you know, v sub x is equal to the magnitude of the, the velocity vector times cosine of theta, which is 30. And likewise, the velocity in the y direction is the magnitude of the velocity times the sine of 30. So in our situation, at this point right here, uh, x is 500. So 500, and the initial x is 0, plus the velocity in the x direction is v cosine of 30 times time. And we can solve this for time is equal to 500 over v cosine 30. These are all scalar equations. And in the y direction, the equation was uh, y is equal to y naught uh, plus the velocity in the y direction times time minus one half dt squared. So in our situation here, uh, y is zero, and y started out at zero, and the velocity in the y direction is uh, v sine 30 times time. Uh, minus one half gt squared. So I can now have these two equations. I can substitute one into two and solve for the velocity. So I'll just write out what it looks like. Zero is equal to uh, v sine of 30 times t, which is 500 over v cosine 30. Uh, minus one half g times the time squared, so it'd be 500 over v cosine 30 squared. And I'll leave it to you to do the arithmetic here. The velocity comes out to be 136.4 feet per second. So let's draw the free body and the impulse and momentum diagrams. So what this is, this is the golf ball here and initially it's at rest, so there's no velocity vector. Uh, when the ball gets struck, we have this impulse here, and we have you know, the weight and the normal force, uh, but they are so small compared to the impulsive force, it's F, that we're gonna assume that those are zero. And the end state after the impulse is the momentum vector M times V acting uh, on the golf ball. And I'll write that out, so m times the velocity, the initial velocity, plus the sum of the integral of the forces acting on the golf ball, two points, one and two, is equal to the mass times the final velocity. Well, the initial velocity is zero, so I'm going to say that at the average force acting on the ball, is a constant, so we can say the average force times dt, now remember the time was um, half a millisecond, so that would be 0.5 times 10 to the minus 3. That is equal to the mass, which is 1 pound over 32.2 slugs, times the velocity, which we just determined was 136.4 times cosine 30i plus sine 30j. Now a little clean up here, these are all vectors. So is this one. So you can solve this for the average force. It's equal to 734 in the I plus 424 in J. And that is pounds.
This includes section 15.1, principles of linear impulse and momentum. Next up is linear impulse and momentum and conservation of linear momentum for a system of particles.